Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending this event sponsored by the Society of Professional Journalists New England Chapter. My name is Ashlyn Wright, and I'm here tonight with Bob Ryan. Bob Ryan is a former sports columnist for the Boston Globe. He started working for the Globe in 1968, and though he is retired, his byline still appears in the paper semi-regularly. He has covered all of Boston sports teams and has been described as the quintessential American sports writer. He is here to talk to us tonight about his new book, In Scoring Position, 40 Years of a Baseball Love Affair. Bob, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Nice to yeah. have my life. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, your career has been absolutely incredible. Can you give me just a brief summary of how you got to where you are now? Uh, well, we start with the idea that I was born into a, a sports family. My father was involved in sports in various capacities of administration, of public relations, et cetera, and both the uh, minor league baseball level when I was very small, and then later on, uh, still small, but not that small, at, uh, and you, uh, Villanova, he was assistant athletic director. And so I got involved uh, right away with, uh, with baseball immediately, with minor league baseball in the late 40s in Trenton, New Jersey, my hometown. They, were in a, they had a team that was a, a, a minor league affiliate of the New York Giants. And so the folklore of the family is I was, I was taken to all these games as an infant and child and a toddler. And that I was president when Willie Mays made his organized baseball debut in 1950 in Trenton, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I always put it this way, Ashwin. I, and this is the gospel truth. This is not hyperbole. I do not recall a general time in my early life when we weren't at a game, going to a game or getting ready to go to a game. So that when people rhapsodize, as they do so often, I remember my first trip to, to Fenway. I remember my first trip to the ballpark. I went with dad and Uncle Joe and grandpa, and I saw the green grass, and the, I was so excited. I don't have that epiphany because I have no idea when the first game was because that's all we ever did. So, I mean, I wake up in the morning in, the, in the, my, my seven, eight, nine-year-old years and, and the Sunday, and he said, we're going to Philadelphia today. We're going to Connie Mac Stadium, or we're going to the Polo Grounds in New York. And that's what we did. So anyway, it's in my blood. It's in my DNA. Now, concurrent with that, uh, and I had a normal childhood uh, playing, you know, just playing in the neighborhood. We had a great neighborhood. Um, I like to read. And so from the beginning, early beginning, uh, I was a reader. And uh, like when I was nine years old, I got a day, they, 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 my mother and father gave me a Christmas gift subscription to Sport Magazine, which was utterly indispensable in the 50s and 60s, and the Sporting News, the Baseball Bible, quote unquote. And I'm nine years old. And I also got a book called Modern Baseball Strategy, which is on this bookshelf behind me in 1955, uh, written by Paul Richards, then the manager of the, of the Chicago White Sox. I mean, sports are in my blood. And, and um, that, that, that's how it all started. And then I you know, they had the right training. The Mercy Nuns taught me good English. Uh, Lawrenceville School was, was an incredible uh, a, a opportunity to, to do everything I like to do, reading and writing. And then uh, I worked on the school paper there. And, and I went to Boston College and I worked on the school paper and, and the radio station and also part time in the sports information office, which was the actual conduit to getting an interview with the Globe for a summer internship. And that was the door to that. When I got that summer internship at 68, uh, I didn't know it was going to be a start of 44 year career at the Globe uh, until I officially retired in 2012. Awesome. Now you say you grew up watching sports games and stuff. Did you ever play any sports or just oh, of watch? Of course, a normal childhood. Uh, I, was a, I was a good little league baseball player, all-star, quote unquote. But when the time came to, at age 13 to go to Babe Ruth League Baseball, uh, I wasn't a good enough athlete to make the the, the good change to the 90-foot uh, diamond. I was slow with a bad arm. That's a not good a combina combination. So uh, other than intramurals and prep school, baseball, my playing career ended. What I did play was basketball. And I played basketball and I was on the varsity. And I, I had the normal progression uh, uh, there with, you know, start as a freshman, start on the JVs, come off the bench as a junior and start as a senior. That's a very normal, normal progression. And I had that progression. Uh, so, and I played basketball up into my forties and finally my back became a little problem. Mm -hmm. So I loved, I played, we had a totally normal childhood. We went totally seasonal. We played touch football in the fall. We played baseball in the summer and we had the opportunity to shoot, to play basketball uh, ultimately all year round. Awesome. So what made you decide to write this book and what was it like to reflect back on the 40 years of baseball games that you've covered? Well, I did not decide to write this book. Bill Chuck, here's where Bill Chuck, my collaborator and, and partner and friend comes into uh, the story. Uh, Bill Chuck is a well-known in the baseball community uh, as a researcher and as a historian. Currently, he works uh, for among other things uh, for Charlie Steiner, the play-by-play the -play guy of the Los Angeles, uh, of the Dodgers. And 
Uh, he writes a Sunday column for the Chicago Sun Tribune. He has been in academia in his life. He worked at Emerson College here for many years. He's, he's been in newspapers. He's, but his, his love, like mine, his mistress is, is, is baseball. My mistress was, even though I was, became known for, as, for basketball, uh, I'm in the you know, Kirk Dowdy Award in the Naismith Hall of Fame for basketball. But my, uh, my original love and my total permanent passion has always been baseball. Bill and I were acquaintances. We, didn't, we have never even been in each other's presence more than two or three times, even now. So, but he, we were on the phone in, in, in April of 2020. And, and, and he uh, knew about my score, my subject of my scorebooks. This is the original scorebook from the 1977 baseball season that I became the beat man on, on, the, on the Celtics, on the Red Sox beat for the globe. And this is the baseball writers issue scorebook that you have, that you had. And this encompasses the entire 1977 season, exhibition season, regular season and postseason. Okay, I have nine of these books. This one being number nine. The most recent entry was a week ago Sunday uh, at, the, at, at Fenway, okay? I score every single game that I go to. And that means whether I'm working or I'm there for fun. And that includes vacations in the country, domestic, not in Paris or London. But whenever I would leave home, starting uh, in, in the beginning of baseball season, I always made sure to pack my scorebook just because everybody knows, you never know when a baseball game is going to break out. And, and uh, several times on, on, on these trips, I was able to have my book ready when, when I had an opportunity to go to a minor league game or, or even a major league game. So I have nine of these books encompassing 1,400 plus games. And Bill said, you got a book in there. And I said, and this is where we differ, by the way. Uh, I said, no, nah, you're crazy. I, yeah, yeah, no, no way. And, and he said, yes. And he said, why don't you run the idea by somebody and, and, and see what they think, and, and, which I did. And I got some positive response. And then I went to my agent, Andrew Blauner, and, and said, here's the deal. And, and he went and sold the book to, to uh, Triumph Books in Chicago. Now, Bill's version, this is like, if you know Gigi, uh, I, I remember it well with Marie Chevalier and Hermione Gingold. Uh, you know, I, I said, it was, I wore blue. No, you wore red, blah, blah, blah. You know, OK. He says, I took immediate uh, interest in it and, and, and embraced the idea from get go. That is not my recollection. My recollection is I, I thought this was crazy. And Bill talked me into it. So I believe there would be no book without Bill Chuck. And there wouldn't be a book as it is, as good as it, I think we think it is, without Bill Chuck. Yeah. Because what, the way it's constructed, for people who don't know, is that uh, I've, we've chosen these 150 games over the course of the 40, uh, this goes from 77 to 2021. So over the course of the 47 years. That's why the title of the book is a mis misleading. It's much longer than a 40 year uh, love affair because it predates 77 by you know almost 40 years to start with. It's a 70 year, right, frankly, 70 plus. Anyway, anyway. Um, at the top of a page, you will see the representation of the scorebook page, you know, with the item in question, why are we writing about this? Then I write what it's all about. And if there's a personal uh, anecdote attached, which, I, I, you know, that, that so much the better. And Bill then writes in uh, with a historical overview, or maybe fleshes out the story of the person, in, uh, or sees something else in that game that I didn't even see, which he's so good at. And, 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 he's, and the thing is, he's not just a, a statistic nerd. He can write. He's an excellent writer. So the, it, it's, and we had fun. I've done 15 books. And I can tell you right now, and any author would tell you, that uh, the word fun is never attached to your writing project. And I always liken writing a book to having a giant term paper hanging over your head every day when you get out of bed. This book was different. I looked forward to every day while in the writing process. I look forward to going through these books and finding the games and thinking back about the games and, and, and seeing what was in there. And, and so it, it was a fun project from start to finish. That's great. So with the writing process, since you weren't the only author on the book, how did the writing process go? Like, did you, you know, did you kind of write your half and then send it to him and he edited it or how did that work? Basically, he didn't edit it. The ed actually, the editor. There's a third party involved. His wife is an editor. Maxie, is, Maxie Chuck is. She's a professional person, writer. She would make, and but mostly she edited. She had a few comments about mine, you know, go here and there, uh, and and you know, the constructive criticism, uh, and uh, and and she definitely edited bills. No, we complimented it. It, it was. It wasn't. I had no trouble. Uh, he he didn't question my writing ever, and 
and uh, you know, we just make sure we got the facts straight. You know, that's important them actually. And and I I found out right away how how facile his writing was, and and never had a problem with. And and he wrote off me, and he used you know was able to kind of, kind of get the punchline sometimes you know based on what I had written. And 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 the, as the book goes on, he's able to reference back the things I had said. You know, and 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 it, it it's very smooth. And 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 it's easy writing. One of the things about this kind of a book. Is you know you don't have to read it. You can you can put it down and pick it up two weeks later and, and then read another couple of chapters or you know, games and you know and and it's easy reading and, and and I think very fun reading. How many games did you end up covering in the book? One hundred and fifty, give or take. And, wow. and that goes from beginning and right from uh, the first one. The first entry is early in a seventy-seven regular season, and it goes right up to a game in April of twenty twenty-one. Now, when we were writing, I was writing, the writing process took place basically in the months of February, March, April of 2021, and uh, I mean, and a little into June. And we wanted to see if we could, we, you know, keep it as current as possible with something. And we hit the, not that, I won't exaggerate, hit the jackpot, but we got a, a, a very logical entry uh, that, that, and a game that took place in April of 21, a book, that, uh, something that would fit into the premise of the book. So it encompasses everything from 77 to 19, 2021. Now, of course, you've covered the Red Sox for the Boston Globe, and the past 20 years alone have been jam-packed with historic games, including four World Series titles. How did you go about deciding which games to highlight in your book? Well, you can't have everything, obviously, with the games, although they, they fortunately, there was a, a minimum number of games since they swept twice, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and 04 and 07. But, uh, you know, just a, a back and forth. What, what do you think? What do you think? You know, what do, how about this one? There was some good things in there that you know we wanted to make sure we had. Um, yeah, it was a it, it was a nego no, I don't want to say negotiation. It was a collaboration. It was a you know, and, and I don't think we had we never had any violent disputes about anything at, at all. It was just a matter of, of creme de la creme, quite frankly. So it was a matter of of, of, of judgments. Um, and and you know we we kidded all along. Well, if we don't use this one, it'll be in volume two. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we kidded about that all the time. We still do. That'll be in volume two. <laughs> Do you plan on writing a second book that follows the if, kind if of there, format? If there was a clamor, if, if you know, if, 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 if how wonderful, if we ever sold enough books that there was an interest that level, that that publisher would be interested in doing so, you're damn right we'd do another one. But, <laughs> you know, I, I don't harbor any ridiculous illusions about that. Um, I'm, I'm happy if, if, you know, a lot of people get, and by the way, I do not know, have any numbers, I have no idea how it's going. Uh, I, I know we get nice word of mouth, we get tweets and thank you and this and that. But I, I truly don't know. I, I never ask any of my other books. I never, ever ask the publisher you know, about numbers or how it's going. How did you feel when the Red Sox won their first World Series in over 80 years? I have to ask about that. Oh, sure. um, yeah, I, I know that, you know, they thought that they, you know, were cursed and after all the Babe Ruth stuff and all that. So do you remember, I'm sure you do, but do you remember how that felt? Like what? I never, obviously, I never bought into the whole nonsense of the curse of the Bambino and it's a ridiculous, although I'm a <laughs> player and no one knows where it came from. Uh, now, a lot of people think that Dan Shaughnessy, my friend and colleague, who wrote a book called The Curse of the Bambino back around 1990, um, uh, invented it. He didn't invent it. And, 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 uh, the first time I ever heard about it was circa 1983, when uh, a friend of a friend, uh, the, my friend was Henry Hector of the New York Post, and his friend was Daryl Berger, who's a Unitarian Universal Minister, who happened to live in Situate, Mass, two towns down. And we were visiting with him one afternoon, and, and he's a big sports fan. And, he's, uh, and he was saying about the, the curse of the Bambino, which was that by selling the Babe Ruth to the Red Sox, to the Yankees in 1920, the Red Sox committed an original sin from which there could be no redemption eternally that's the course that is the but he didn't know where he heard it i've asked him subsequently no one knows where it comes from and no one has documented this where it comes from it's fascinating it's like dirty jokes supposedly all emanate in prison that's what they say you know that's what i was told all along but um no no one knows anyway i never bought it that at all had nothing to do with the curse of Indian. now um i i lived through it. You know, I didn't grow up as a Red Sox fan. You know, I, I grew up as a New York Giants baseball fan and, and Philadelphia Phillies fan. And, and I came to Boston and I was indifferent to the Red Sox my first two years in Boston, 64 and five, even 66. 
I wasn't paying a great deal of attention to them. I went to a few games here and there. And, but in 1967, with, which is the dividing line in Red Sox history, which is the most important single season in Red Sox history in terms of this, the, uh, setting their, their, their business model in place and, 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 and creating a fandom uh, and forever and ever. In 1967, they had this miraculous, wonderful season. And I took my then girlfriend, now wife of 53 years, Elaine Murray Ryan, to a doubleheader uh, in, uh, around, uh, uh, on or around Memorial Day. And they beat the Indians in that doubleheader and I got hooked. And I was there were the first two of 27 games that I went to that summer. And many of them with her. And we were in the stands on October 167 uh, when they won the pennant and, and, and beat the Twins and all that. So anyway, then they lost the seventh game of the, that year. They lost the seventh game in 75. They lost the infamous sixth and seventh games in 86. Um, and, the, and the story mounted and the folklore. And then Dan's book had a lot to do with creating fervor and all, and all that. So now we get to 04. And, and well, here's where I start. On game three, Saturday night, they lose 19 to eight to the Yankees. They're down 03. No team has ever come back from an 03 deficit in baseball history in the playoffs. And, um, and I had written a column. Uh, my column was that there was, had been a lot of dialogue prior to the playoffs. The people who, oh, we've got to, I want to play the Yankees. We want to play the Yankees. And I didn't give a damn who they played as long as they played, you know, played well. And I, I wrote the column and said, okay, you happy now? You had the Yankees. Look at this, you know, mess. 11 nights later, they're sipping the champagne in St. Louis. So it was the whole eight, those 11 days, you know, that's what I'm, and, and winning the four games. Uh, and against New York with the epic fifth game, fourth game, I, I mean, with the, with the Millar walk and the Dave Roberts steal and, and the, uh, Bill Miller single off Rivera and then Poppy winning the game with the home run and then winning the next game and 14th inning, great drama that night. Both games ending on the same calendar day because game four ended after midnight and game five started at 5 p.m. And, and then on and on. And the bloody sock game was game six. And then game seven, they just obliterated the Yankees whose pitching staff was depleted. Johnny Damon hits a grand slam and puts it away right away early. And Derek Lowe pitches a great game. And of course, Derek Lowe was on the mound to win the, all three series, which was never been done before or since. So um, I, that's what I remember, the totality of the events and the fact that if you're going to wait 86 years, it certainly ended with a, with a flourish, you know, and, uh, and, and, and that's a fact. And uh, that's, uh, I remember, oh, I'm just a fan. I, I've never seen, I'm, I'm like, uh, there's, I won't say there's two kinds, but definitely speaking, there's two branches of writers. Uh, the larger branch uh, are, are the the objective observers. You know, they, they 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 only care about the story. They don't worry about who wins and loses. And I'm in the minority. It's all about being a fan to me, and and reflecting the viewpoint and 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 the hopes and fears and 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 desires of fans more often than not, because I know what it's like. And 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 I, and to me, oh, here's one I'll throw at you. You hear people say. I, I just write about people. You know, I want to write about the people involved. I say, that's fine. That's the easiest thing about writing. If you, if you have any degree of command of the language, sensitivity, uh, you know, humor, uh, compassion, blah, 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 you can write about people. That's a layup drill. The hard part is making some chicken salad out of you know what on a miserable basketball game on February 8th or, or a miserable baseball game on, on August 2nd. That's the hard part. Anyway, here's my point. Yeah, right, the people. If it weren't for the games, who you would you you wouldn't care about these people? They're, that's the whole point. They're doing something. Whether it's so, whether it's a Bulgarian weightlifter or a major league pitcher or or, or an NBA three point shooter, it's about the, the competition, and ultimately, and that's what moves me. And the people think, fine, I can write about people, and and I have. I'm very proud of some of my profiles, but I'm not. But really, they're not that hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> So you talk a lot about being a fan, like a, a longtime childhood fan of the game. How does it feel to be able to pursue something and write about something that you're so passionate about as your career? It's a fantasy. I mean, I, you know, people often say to you in different walks of life, I, I never worked a day in my life, you know, kind of thing. Well, I never had any heavy manual labor after, after you know, summer jobs and when I was a kid. Uh, I, I worked with a New Jersey highway department for a couple of summers and there was a little bit of lifting going on there but basically i've been a blue a white collar worker my whole life and and oh it's it's what i would have liked i didn't know how the full trajectory 
I never dreamed of going to 11 Olympics, for example. I never dreamed of that. You know, World Series stuff like that, sure. But um, but yeah, it's 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 it's. I'm very fortunate. I mean, now the other thing is, and that's my aptitude, words and 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 that's it, words, uh, because I don't have any mechanical aptitude, zero whatsoever. And and so uh, fortunately, I was I was able to have that avenue to to fulfill what I call. Uh, my aptitude, you know, and, and my aptitude was in that direction, and I and I found a way to take the full advantage of it, and um, and so I, I, I was very blessed and very lucky. In the book, you talk about Yaz's final at bat, Bill the Spaceman Lee's 78 pitch complete game win over the Minnesota Twins, Roger Clemens throwing a one hitter against Cleveland. What's it like revisiting these magical moments? Well, it's fun. Oh, that's why I said the, the project was the easiest. And fun project, you know, the only decision was the hard decisions about what to put in, you know, and, and, and as I said, of course, we have volume two, but no, it was fun. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I was reminded of stuff that I had kind of forgotten about naturally. You can't remember all these 1400 names, but, but so many of them came back. I mean, you know, you talked about Lee's, uh, that same season, he threw a 78 pitch complete game, which I remember vividly and a 79 pitch complete game, which I didn't happen to remember uh, specifically. But I do remember, I always remember that talking to him after the game when he threw the 78 pitch complete game in Minnesota and Fred Lynn made a great catch in that game and, 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 and saying, you know, his, my lead was, how do, what, do you, what do you have for breakfast on the day? It was a Saturday. You know, uh, two eggs, uh, order a toast, coffee, go get them. That's, that was Bill Lee, you know, and that was the lead. And, uh, you know, uh, so I remember stuff like that. I remember Yaz's final game, um, you, know, you remember his last at bat, he was not going to walk, and and the pitcher was the pitcher was overwhelmed by the moment. His name was Dan Spilner of, of the Indians. He was overwhelmed by the moment. Uh, he didn't want to walk Yaz either, but he couldn't throw a strike. And on three and zero, Yaz swung at a pitch up and was around his nose and popped up for his final out. But he was not going to take ball four. That's not the way he wanted to go out. Now it was a meaningless game on the last day of the season. Neither team going anywhere. So he could, you know, if this were a pennant race, obviously it would have been different. But the other thing I remember about that game is that um, uh, he was put in left field after having been a first baseman for years. And sure enough, someone hit one off the wall. And Yaz made a great play off the wall, and nice throw to second, standing ovation for the crowd. You can't script stuff like that. And that's one of the things that Bill and I talk about in this thing is, is you know, you can't make this bleep up, you know, you, you, you can say stuff, but it, the other word being it begins with S. You, you can't make it up. It, it's just it's so many of those moments and, 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 and coincidences or historical oddities that happen that you say, you can't make this stuff up. and. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, there's a game in here that I really love, which is the only time in baseball history when you have an only, you know, that's one of the things we have. We have some onlys. This is the one and only in, in the entire history of baseball in which a guy hit into a triple play and hit a grand slam in successive at-bats. And that was Scott Hattieberg at the Red Sox in 2001. And that's never happened before or since. And the other subplot of it was that the, the really you can't make this stuff up. Brian Dahlbeck was on base for both of them. <laughs> so, you know, that that's kind of cool. But we got stuff like that. What's an example of a game that off the top of your head, you didn't really remember it or remember a lot of details about it. But then when you started actually like thinking about it, it all came back to you and it was all very exciting. Uh, I wish I could give you a good answer to that, but I can't. <laughs> I, I just don't. I don't have one. I'm sorry. Um, no, but uh, certain things, but not 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 to that full apocalyptic extent. No, I, I can't. I don't have anything like that. Okay, yeah. Uh, what games did you want to include in the book but had to leave out? Oh, I don't know. This 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 games with with uh, uh, it was a tough decision, and it was some of the World Series games, some of the playoff games. You know, that I saw some really memorable playoff games uh, that that I'm sure. Uh, uh, I, I tell you something. I don't even remember did we uh, whether I put in um, the the game six of the 1986 NLCS, which was the, the Mets and the, and the I think I did, but if I didn't, I, I'll, I'll shoot myself. Uh, uh, that that's what because everybody here remembers eight, you know 86 from the Red Sox viewpoint, but I was covering the National League series, and and that game six was epic uh, when when the Mets beat the Astros in game six. I think I did have the game in there, so I'm not sure. Um, I'm really not sure. So, yeah, but to tell you the truth, but there's enough stuff that now we kid about this. I'm not going to be, I don't think I have enough for another 150 that would be worthwhile, but I would say we probably have enough for another 
50 that would that we could make a justification what has been your favorite you know i don't know if you just have maybe one or multiple but what's been your favorite games that you've uh covered or been to or experienced yeah well that's a fair question and and i get that in all sports uh i in baseball it, it's the the totality of games four and five in in in, in 2004 uh starting with that ninth inning uh and and really the drama that people remember that full game four very well because that's what the famous David Roberts Steele, and they don't, they remember that more than they remember how he even got on out, out there, which was Kevin Millar working a rare walk over Mariano Rivera in the prime of his career. And then of course the Bill Miller drove in the winning run with a, a, a shot up the middle. And um, I did subsequently, by the way, I did feature stories on both of them. I did one on, on Roberts a year later, I caught up with him and, and uh, he was with the Padres then. And later on, many years later in 2011, I, I caught up with Bill Miller. But anyway, um, but game five, went 14 innings and I, what I'll never forget, it was Tim Wakefield coming in and Deb Mirabelli was his normal catcher as the knuckleball catcher. And, but he was out of the game and it was Jason Baratek who wasn't used to catching uh, uh, the knuckleball. And sure enough, there were two pass balls to put the, the potential winning run on third base in like the 13th inning, 14, top of the 14th. And Wakefield struck out Ruben Sierra to get out of the inning. You know, And then in the bottom of the inning, they mounted a rally and and Poppy had a 10 pitch at bat against uh, Edwin Loiza, and he popped a little blooper in the center for the game winning hit. And uh, but the drama of that uh, game, I remember very, very, very well. But uh, you mentioned those, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there were, there were other, yeah, but that's, I'll say, I'll say those two for sure. Uh, so, yeah, but there's so many, but that, that, that those, but that the combined drama, as I said, 11 hours worth of baseball encompassing those two games. And at that point, you know, we had no idea the Red Sox were going to go on and actually get it done. You know, we didn't know, it was, you know, we, it, that was nice to keep it alive, but they still had to beat the Yankees twice and whoever the National League would put up was, which turned out to be Colorado. I mean, so St. Louis that year, I'm sorry, 04. I never dreamed they were going to sweep St. Louis, trust me. No. Each game you talk about is accompanied by the image of a scorecard that you filled out. Yes. One of them is actually signed by Mr. October Reggie Jackson. Uh -huh. Can you tell us the story behind that? Yeah, one of my favorite stories. Uh, I covered the famous game six in 1977 as working for the Globe, in which Reggie Jackson hit three home runs off on three swings, those three pitches, the first pitch each time, and coupled with his last at bat, that's the the game before in Los Angeles in which he had hit a home run. That means he had took four swings, hit four home runs in four pitches. Okay. So uh, it's Reggie famous. It was in the cap this tumultuous season for Reggie and the Yankees, the great comeback against the, uh, I, I, no. So, uh, fine. Now I had a good fast forward 26 years. It's 2003. And he is now uh, an employee of the Yankees as a consultant. And he's traveling with the team as they come to Fenway in the ALCS. And I had had a good relationship with him. He's in there for a couple, a couple of my other things, reasons too. And I bring my book in to have him sign the book after 26 years. And I bring the book, this book, and I, uh, we're standing in, in, at the, uh, in front of the dugout. Oops, bought the wrong book. <laughs> and standing in front of the dugout, uh, and, and Yankee and, and Fenway. And I show him the book and ask him to sign it. And, and he looks at it and he grabs the book and runs up to the batting cage where Joe Torre is. And he's pointing it like this and he's gesticulating as if to say, you know, I used to play too, you know, to Joe Torre. And comes back and signs the book. And it's just most incredible. Now, you know, he must have rehearsed this a thousand times. It's a beautiful script. Mr. October, Reggie Jackson, Mr. October, and inside the, the J, the loop of the big J, number 44. And that's on my book. And it's no, I don't know how many of them are out there, but not too many are in scorebooks, I'll tell you that. And maybe <laughs> only one, I would be willing to bet. And uh, so that's, I'm really proud of that. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's on the front cover, the representation on the cover of the book. That, that book, you can see over my, my shoulder. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, that, that, that's a fun story. That's awesome. So we got a question in the chat. It says, Boston sports have been loaded with lots of great characters. Manny Ramirez, Pedro Big Pop, 
Pedro Big Poppy, who were your favorites to cover slash interview? And do you have any memories you'd like to share? Well, since you said Boston sports, we have to expand it beyond baseball. And my, my easy in and eternal answer is the most intriguing personality that I've ever covered. Not the best player that was in base basketball was Larry Bird and followed quickly by closely by John Havlicek. And, and I was very friendly with John and I did John's book. The books are both of them. So, you know, so, but Dave Cowens is the answer to that. And Dave Cowens was a fascinating combination of, of a Hall of Fame level player, which he is, a, a, a electrifying style and the most interesting inquisitive uh, personality uh, of, of, of intellectually curious and, and just in interested in lots of things. And, and, and you never knew where the conversation was going to go. And he gave me one of the great lines that anyone's ever going to get. They win the championship in 1974 in Milwaukee on a Sunday afternoon, game seven. And this is the old days flying commercial. And we are flying back to Boston. And we are not only not flying charter, but we are changing planes in Chicago. And I catch up to him. I hadn't talked to him after the game for whatever reason. And I catch up to him and I said, Dave, you, fought, you did it. You won the championship. How's it feel? To which Dave Cowan said, and I quote, the fun for me is in the doing. This is something from my portfolio of basketball experiences, unquote. Now, I waited another 38 years and never got another line like that. And uh, that, 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 that was typical of Dave Cowan's. And so that's the answer. And, and baseball, and, and baseball, um, you got to start with Lee, I guess, you know, in terms of character. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed dealing with Pedro, uh, definitely. And uh, uh, I had a good relationship with Yaz. Yaz could be a little remote at times, but but he was honest. Uh, he, he was he was always available to me as I thought, and uh, um, so there, 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 that that was some. Uh, uh, I never had I didn't have a great. I didn't have any intimate relationship with Poppy, but he was always available. Uh, and good, but uh, you know it was good when I was here. It, it you know it turned out we have our opinion of him uh, politically, but Schilling, he was challenging. He was a uh, it was always intriguing. So. You know, we didn't know, you know, the depths of which he was going to descend, we'll put it that way. <laughs> Since we're on the topic of basketball, I do have to ask, you're known as a basketball expert. How is baseball reporting different from basketball? <clears throat> the reporting, uh, it's not, you know, you know the game, you don't know the game. You care, you love the game, you don't love the game. Uh, in both cases, I love the minutiae of the game as well, the little odd stuff, you know. Uh, I was kidded my boss when I, my then first, my, my retirement boss was Joe Sullivan. And, and I, I said, you know, you should keep me around just to write notes. Because I, I get very infuriated when I watch a game and I see something happen. I said, that's a great note. And it's not in the paper. And I don't care whether it's basketball or baseball. And, and, I, 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 and that's actually what, almost what our book is about is, you know, finding the nuggets, you know, as in addition to the obvious. And, and uh, um, so... I, that, that's the deal. I, I, I don't think it's a difference in the reporting. You know, you, you, you watch the game, you, you do what you got to do. You go in the locker room, come out, you write, you know, you, you write the story and, or you write the feature story the next day, whatever it is. It's not that different. The difference in both of them now is that the access has been diminished severely, you know, from what I knew. Uh, I can't imagine being a writer today and being satisfied with it. If you, if you start out today and this is all you know, well, okay, it's all you know. You don't know what it was like. But if you've ever been, been around for a while, and you know how, how much access you had uh, and, and compared to what you have today, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very depressing. Personally, I, basketball is my game. And I know that you do not, you're not a big fan of the three point shot. Can you tell me about that? I am, I detest the three point shot. I think it's unnecessary. And here's what people don't want to grasp. The three point shot is the mind is, is the uh, invention of a promoter, Abe Saperstein, who owned the Garb Tartars, but he also it created in 1961, a league to rival the NBA called the American Basketball League. And, and he needed to attract the attention of the casual fan and, and, and do something to separate himself from the NBA. And he, and, and he adopted the three-point shot. And that league folded after a year and a half. But the three-point shot was adopted by the Eastern Basketball League, which was the, the forerunner to the Continental League, which is forerunner now to the G League, but was the second best league in the world. And remember, those days there were only eight or nine, eight, depending, eight NBA teams. It's only 80 jobs, so 10 team players. 
and and so there's an awful lot of very good basketball players who didn't have who, who needed to play somewhere and and the next tier of great players played in the eastern league so they picked it up and then in 1966 when the aba the american basketball association came into being as a as a much more significant rival to the nba they adopted not only the three-point shot but the red white and blue basketball and and it was all about gimmicks and uh so it's a gimmick of a promoter we didn't need it there wasn't any call of cl ed stites now in college i must say Dr. Ed Stites, who was the athletic director at Springfield College, was the great godfather of the three-point shot for college basketball, which finally adopted his thing in 1986. But, uh, but there was no great clamor for the three. It distorts the game at every level. It distorts the game. And, and as now it's become the currency. Uh, and, and when I see guys pass up two footers and pass out to an iffy three in a corner, I want to, you know, oh, I, I just, well, the word <laughs> I won't use. But uh, it, it, it's it's not needed, but it's here, and it's and I I'm I'm so worried that before I go there'll be a four point shot, and I mean it. I think there's a clamor for it, and uh, uh, it distorts the game at every level. When you see these 11 year old kids shooting threes and and and, and high school kids hoisting threes, and and now now the shooting accuracy isn't going up dramatically because this is people are training themselves to do this. I understand, and I I kiddingly write a column in, in February this year about Stephon Curry. That, that he's the worst, you know, he's, he's ruined basketball and he's ruined basketball because he's so good at it and so likable in, in addition as a personality and such an exemplary player in, other, in many other ways that he's, he's the model. He's the, most, he's the most influential player of the 21st century. There's no disputing that. He has influenced more players and will continue to influence more people than any player in basketball in the 21st century. And, um, and, and, and so like you know, kiddingly, you know, said he was a menace. And so in my eyes, he's a menace. But a, a charming one. One of our attendees, Alan, wants to know, is there any hope to reducing the influence of the three? And is there an aspect of baseball? Oh, sorry, wrong question, <laughs> different question. Is there any hope to reducing the influence of the three? No, no, I'm, a, I'm in a very shrill minority. And there are some I hear, and it's very generational, by the way, uh, very generational. Um, you know, when I get uh, approving tweets and emails, uh, you can bet that the demographic is 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 AARP and uh, and up. And I understand that. If, if, if consider this, just talk about the NBA for a second, which didn't adopt it until '79. Uh, so think about how old you'd have to be not to know what the three. You know, you're in your 50s, just practically. Now that's that the not to know. That's the game you know. You don't remember the game before that. You don't remember when pivot play was essential, when centers ruled the roost, when Kevin McHale was killing people in the low post. Nobody does that anymore. And that's a, I just want balance. I'm not saying if they would just has a, use a, if teams and coaches would use a rational approach to it, they use it as a weapon, but not the whole game, you know. And, and, and it leads to some ridiculous games in which both teams are off and you'll see things like 12 for 50 on threes. And that's a joke. And, and, and but only if people old enough to know what it used to look like don't think it's a joke because they don't know anything else. And, and that so no, it's not going anywhere. No, I sadly, no. Now, Alan's second question is is there an aspect of baseball that you dislike on par with the three? Well, it, it's it's not specifically anything. I, I don't like this ghost runner, this new you know, second this in the tenth inning thing. We call it ghost, whatever you want to call it. The man on second base to start the extra innings. You know, this this is an overreaction to to the idea that there was a plethora of extra long games, 16, 17 innings. There were a couple occasional ones. The real culprit is the pace of the game, starting with <laughs> there should be a pitch clock, religiously and emphatically enforced. In addition to which, there should be a prohibition about batters leaving the batter's box unless a pitch and the umpire's judgment has forced them out of it at their nose or chin or chest. Uh, and then they can request a timeout, which may or may not be granted. I'm serious. Uh, it, apparently we're having data being supplied right now from the minor leagues that indeed we are getting a, 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 an improvement in game time due to the pitch clocks that are being uh, implemented in, in minor leagues. That's a must. That means it should be a very logical thing to do. Train them in the minor leagues that this is the way the world's going to be. And, and you want these games reduced in time. Uh, other than that, um, what are you going to do with the way to, the shift? I, I, I can't make up my mind whether the shift should be, uh, you know, restricted 
uh, there were a lot of talk about how to make sure that two people on each side of the second base. Uh, I'd rather see players try to adapt to it better and more guys, left-handed batters go the other way, et cetera. Then, then, and I'm not ready to completely outlaw the shift. And, and um, then of course, the other thing is a philosophy about how to swing and, and you know, we have what's so-called the three outcome game, strikeout, walk and home run. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't like that either. And, and, uh, but that's gonna be a tougher thing to overcome because you're talking about having people, you know, how they're gonna swing a bat and it's a different thing. As you were working on this book, the Red Sox were making another magical run and came up just short of another World Series. What was it like to watch that run? And were you tempted to get a new scorebook to add to your book? Oh, I was doing, I was, I, was, I had a scorebook. I was there. I'm a season ticket holder. I have been since 1991. So I, I was, I've been through all these apparent runs. This was four, seven, four and seven as a writer, 13 and 18 as a fan. And enjoyed them immensely. And then, you know, the last year I was at the end of oh no, I, I, uh, I'm there. As I said, I have a entry in the books from 2021. So no, I'm, I haven't ever abandoned uh, the, the, the pursuit and we go to games and, and I score every one. Were you tempted to put that run in this book though? Well, last year, no, there's nothing we can do about that. You know, you have it, you have publication realities about lag times and, and so forth. So there's nothing we could do. I was just happy that we could include the game from 2021 at all, you know, which we did from April. And it had to do with the idea, you know, and, and there's a growing number now. It's, it's not as, you know, unfortunately it's not as, you know, interesting uh, or detached from uh, the norm as, as it once was. The growing number of position players who are being used as pitchers in mop-up games, including, we had one this past a couple of days ago, each team used one. <laughs> which is interesting. Um, but uh, we, I, I thought it was fun. The White Sox in 2021 uh, used two different position players to, pit, to finish a game, one of whom struck out somebody, and the other one got somebody to ground out on a, a 40 mile an hour or something or other, which was fun. And that, that, so that's, that's a genesis. So it got us to talk, that led us into a discussion about position players pitching. And of course, we had one very recently here. Jackie Bradley Jr. pitched in the last homestand. Didn't do that badly either, by the way. Threw over 90 and, and they struck out. Oh, he struck out DJ LeMayo, which is going to, you know, he'll have to take that to his grave. And he got two strikes an hour and judge. The place was electric. And yeah, they're getting crushed by the Yankees. Ballpark in the ninth inning was going crazy because Jackie Bradley had two strikes an hour and judge. And he finally walked him. And unfortunately, but at least he didn't get a hit. Give him a hip. Do you remember your first time going into any team locker room as a reporter assigned to cover a game? Yes. Uh, and that would be op uh, for the Boston Globe. That, well, as a, I don't remember my intern year specifically in 68, there was any, but I do remember the first time I was the guy in 1969 as, as a um, uh, beat man for the Celtics. I'm given this job, I'm 23 years old. I, I, I do not have, had, they gave, I had no opportunity to cover an exhibition game. I had not met any players. I had not met any coaches, any coach. There were no coaches. It was one coach, no assistant, Tom Heinsohn. Opening night against the Cincinnati Royals, coached by, Someone I did know, Bob Cousy, because I had gone to Boston College and he was the coach and I was the student broadcaster. And, and so I knew him. Anyway, um, I'm in the Royals locker room and I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I'm interviewing, they, they won the game, 110 108, and I'm interviewing the legendary Oscar Robertson. And it dawned in me, it struck me, oh my God, I'm talking to Oscar Robertson. And I was like, kind of freaked out. Yes, I remember that very well. And uh, that was, that was, and I, I, uh, I didn't have the pace of what I should be doing down. I had no training. To, there's no manual teaching how to do this stuff. And uh, uh, I, I missed the first deadline at night, you know, and uh, because I was too slow. And uh, that never happened again. Never, naturally. Uh, I, but I had to learn how to pick up the pace a little bit after the game. Um, but I do remember being thinking, oh, my God, I'm talking to Oscar Robertson. And that was like, that was surreal. Yes. What's your most memorable or weirdest interaction in a locker room? Uh, <laughs> uh, in 1975, at a time when, uh, when, when writers would, when, when columnists would go on vacation or whatever, that uh, anybody could be given a chance to write a column. That doesn't happen anymore, but it was policy then. And I, I had been writing the, under that basis for some columns for a couple of years. 
And I wrote a column, the Red Sox uh, were embarking on a two week road trip in June of 75. And I wrote a column and analyzing the state of affairs. And uh, among the things I suggested was that uh, Yaz who was, should bat sixth against left-handers. And another one I suggested, uh, uh, we'll have to, there's two stories to come out of this. One's funny, one is what you're looking for, the locker room encounter. Uh, Doug Griffin was the second baseman and he wasn't going well. And, 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 he had, and I wrote, he was quote, a totally unacceptable major league second baseman, unquote. Well, the, the column appeared and Ken Harrelson was the color man then with Dick Stockton. And, and he whipped the column that night and the first night on the road. But, and that one, we went from there and then they went on the road. And then when they came home, they came home the weekend, the later the next week. And Friday night they played the Yankees. I didn't go, but I did go on Saturday. And I went into the locker room on Saturday after the game, Saturday afternoon game. Just, and I, I was, I forget what I was going to be writing about, but I remember going over to say hello to Johnny Pesky, the famous great coach who was, I had a good relationship with. And I felt the sensation behind my back. And I turned around, and there was Doug Griffin, who had been harboring his resentment for 10 days. And he starts shoving me, he puts his hands on me, starts shoving me, and says, Get out of here, get out of here. You don't belong here, blah, blah, blah. And his clubhouse manager said, Bob, you know, I think you should leave because I don't want to mess everything up for everybody else. So I go out in the locker room, I mean, out in the corridor. And here comes Dwight Evans, because I had also mentioned in his column that. They, which, that they could consider trading Dwight Evans. And he spits on the floor, literally, and says, says, don't, I don't want you writing anything about me, good or bad, <laughs> which is kind of funny line. Well, long, well, this became a co-celeb, but this made the, the AP picked up the story. I, I heard from people all over the country about this and it eventually blew over. Two years later, I'm the beat guy and I wind up getting along great with both of those guys, by the way, all right. So that's the most memorable locker room thing. But the other thing out of that was, was interesting. One of the lines I wrote was about two pitchers on the staff, Reggie Cleveland and Diego Segui. And I said, as far as Reggie Cleveland and Diego Segui are concerned, there's a charter plane leaving tomorrow with Amelia Earhart at the controls, which is a line I wouldn't write today, I don't think. But well, next day I'm in the office and the phone rings and I pick up the phone. It's Amelia Earhart's sister who lived in Squanum, Massachusetts. <laughs> so uh, I said to myself, geez, I thought the statute of limitations would be more than 38 years, you know, which is what, you know, Amelia Hart disappeared in 1937. Anyway, so that column had a lot of life. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> Where was a better place to cover a game, the Old Garden or Fenway Park? Well, if you're talking logistics, uh, boy, they were both equal. Uh, uh, in a, the old, the old, I mean, for, for, from a logistical standpoint or from the, 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 fi, the fan reaction, the fan feel, that kind of thing. Um, Fenway, as we, they've done what they succeeded in doing. And I'll give, I'll give Larry Lucchino and Janet Marie Smith, the architect who should be in the Hall of Fame, uh, credit. Because their motto was do no harm. And they, they created a circumstance at Fenway where by adding on and doing the things they did, which the prior administration had no vision for doing and no, no stomach for doing, uh, they haven't wrecked a ballpark. It's still the most interesting ballpark in baseball, even more than Wrigley. There's no place, it's, it's, it, it has a unique flavor that no one can match. Wrigley would be second, but it's not, not even close. And so they haven't messed that place up, they've enhanced it. And so it's, it's still a great place and it's easier to work there now because of the logistics that they created. We used to have to go in the, uh, there were no elevators. And in the um, old days, if you were gonna go down to the locker room, you had to leave your seat in the eighth inning and go down a back staircase through the stands all the way down to the first base side and try to find a vacant seat on the first baseline to sit in before you then went into the locker room and watch the ninth inning. Well, today you can on the elevator, which is held for you, you know, down to the area. There's no logistical problem. That was a real pain, believe me. And uh, the garden was a difficult place to negotiate physically too, but it, it's better now. So, uh, they, you know, but, but uh, Fenway has not been harmed. Fenway has only been enhanced. 
you've moved into prominence on TV and host a great podcast too. How does baseball evolve as successfully as you have? <laughs> <laughs> well, the interesting thing is uh, for baseball, one of the great problems is the demographics and, and the nature of the game and the pace of the game that people have worried for years and years uh, does not appeal to the younger generation. Uh, so, you know, and uh, it, it's not in tune with the times of the younger generation. And, and you know, it may not be. I, I know in 1990, in 68, when they had a crisis with the, the uh, pitcher's dominance, they, they one way they got hitting back in the game was to lower the mound. And, and it remains at that same height. Um, uh, and and they, it survived the crisis. And of course they got reborn with the home run derby in 98. And then we find out that was a lot of it was bogus with Bonds and Sosa and McGuire and uh, so forth. But uh, the, the game is, I think generally in certain cities is scary. You know, it's Oakland, both Florida's or the tennis terrible. Baltimore uh, had fallen off badly. Um, and, and, it, and here's the thing, nothing's permanent. People, uh, this game is an old game. It's 170 years old. It goes back to 18, 19, 50, 1850, but and, and then organized ladies go back to 1871. But, you know, um, maybe it's a shelf life that's going to expire in the middle of the 21st century and something else will, will take over. So uh, um, I'm, I, I feel, you know, worry about that, but I, I don't think I'll be worried, you know, upright when the final demise comes. But, you know, you, could, you get these uh, pockets of interest that are still very staunch. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen ultimately. But in terms of, you know, my career, <laughs> um, I, I, I don't kid anybody. I know my demographic is still skews you know, AARP, but, uh, uh, um, you know, I try to keep up with the, with the times and not be a fuddy duddy, uh, but, you know, you do have opinions and, you know, we talked about the three point shot, right. And, you know, that, that, that's, I saw the game, you know, when you see, you know, the game could have was and could be. And, and, and when someone doesn't know what it was and could be, you understand I've written this too. I understand uh, someone having only lived with the three, not understanding how the game was, in my judgment, better without it. And I understand that. And I, I, I and you have to be open, open-minded. What do you make of LeBron's recent comments on Boston fans and racism in our sports here today? Well, there's two things that come out of that. The first one is I don't know what it's like down in the trenches, down in the garden anymore. And, and, and how, what, what is the percentage, you know, does he hear an occasional isolated ep epithet does he hear disturbing, organized routine? I have no idea what, what the extent. I don't deny that something could happen, you know, which I don't think is endemic to Boston. Could be anywhere. But here's the one that is ridiculous, and this has got to be stopped. And this is why when he says things like this, you worry that people would believe it. I find out, reading the paper today, that he claims that T-shirts saying, you know, F you, F LeBron, are sold at the team shop. Well, you, you know that's wrong. I know where they're sold. That's, that stand that sets up on the corner of Causeway Street and Canal Street. Yeah, I, I know that. And, and, and that, that's where it is, that, that, that outdoor stop. And just like, well, that's where they used to sell the Jeter Sucks t-shirts and everything else. No, you know, so that's why if you, somebody's got to make the clear to the world. That the, and the Red Sox, have, oh, is, I, I see Adam, I mean, Celtics, Adam Himmelsbach quote, didn't quote anybody specifically but saying, no, we don't sell those t-shirts. We never would do a thing like that. And they wouldn't. But I'm afraid that people at large are going to believe that that's true. You know, we, we're still living down a, a, a sordid history of the Red Sox being the last team to integrate of the, 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 the 70s busing stuff. People can go YouTube and find, the, uh, and find some of the awful stuff that took place here during those days, including Ted Landsmark having a flag punched in his face. You know, they're available to people. And, and, and we're still living down that legacy and we may never get out from under from that, but come on, LeBron, you honestly and truly think that the Celtics would promote a t-shirt like that. Don't be ridiculous. And I'm disappointed because I, I want to like him. I don't have any antipathy toward him at all. Uh, at all. I, I admire his game and I think he's, he's stayed out of the trouble. You don't see him in the, on the wrong page of the paper, you know what I'm saying? Ever for any reason. And, uh, um, I, but I wish he would disavow that thing and admit he's wrong on that because that's a bad thing to say, charging that. That's utterly ridiculous. 
Austin is, of course, the hub of the sports universe. Your name still appears on the byline of stories occasionally, but how hard is it to stay retired given that all four major teams are always either competing for a championship or at least in the discussion? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I retired for a reason and those reasons are valid. I'm glad I did. Uh, and, and, uh, and so, but being able to keep my hand in it to a degree to, to keep, I call it good busy and have a voice, you know, that if people want to hear what I have to say, it's flattering, frankly. I, I, when I retired, if you could go back and look and you can find it, it's easy to find uh, the column I wrote when I retired, it's out there. And, and, and uh, I said uh, I, that I, I would love that if I could squeeze another year or two out of, you know, this and, and come see me in a year, I'll let you know how things are going. It'll be 10 years on August 12th since I officially retired. My last official act was to hit the send button on the gold medal basketball game in London at the basketball Olympics and at the Olympic games. And uh, I've managed to, over the years, you know, as you said, do uh, uh, read a column, which once upon a time was 30 times a year. Now it's every other Sunday. Uh, I, I was on the round the horn, basically weekly. Now I'm on every other week. And um, I had a podcast of my own for about 50 episodes. Then I had a podcast with Mike Lupik and, and, and Mitch Album, which was finally canceled. And, 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 and uh, um, March and now Jeff Goodman, Gary Tangway and I have a basketball podcast once a week. So I got three things, three basic, uh, and I've written two books in retirement. The first one was Scribe, my autobiography in 14. And now this book that we're discussing tonight. Uh, and that kept me busy. But, uh, you know, you have to be realistic here. Uh, you know, you, you're, 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 you're off, off center stage. And I used to kid, I know when I wrote, you know, I said, you know, I, you, I, I, you know, you have to know when you get off the stage. And uh, I'm being slowly phased out. I'm, you know, I had a lot more, you know, at one point I had a lot of things going, but it's a realistic, uh, it's the way it should be. Um, you know, I, um, every once in a while, a game, I'll, go to, I'll go to a game, uh, a Red Sox game specifically, and something will happen, it'll be a good game. I said, boy, that would be fun to write. I wish I, I would have liked to have written that game, but not all the time. Most of the time, you know, I'm thinking, hey, pack up, pack up the book, go home, you know. Nice. Uh, that's good. I don't have to worry about anything. Um, but every once in a while, it's something, else. you know, that that spark is still, you know, in you. I think I had something to contribute. I still think I have something to contribute. I can, uh, as a historical, if it's a historical relic, okay, it's a historical relic, you know, uh, and that that's understandable. We have time for one more question. So I'd like to end on, as we've mentioned before, you've covered baseball for over 40 years and Boston might be the most spoiled fan base in sports right now. Who is the most underrated Sox player or team in general that you covered during your career? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I don't think that the, the, um, this generation, I, and we've gone through this once the Red Sox started winning. And once I started winning and, and, and with the four championships, one of the things that you have to do is, is, is place in, try to place 1967 in the minds and in and, and a proper historical placement for, to the younger generation. People say, well, they didn't win. You have to understand winning the pennant was a huge thing then. You had one pennant, you, know, you, didn't, you had one race, you didn't have divisional playoffs. You, know, you won, you went to the World Series. And they had not won since 1946 at that point and 21 years. And they'd suffered through uh, a, a really dismal early 60s run uh, right after Ted Williams retired. And, you know, and it was a dismal point. They had 650,000 people for attendance in 1965. That's a couple of home stands now, maybe three, right? They had 800,000 in, in, in 66. And then suddenly in 67, the town came alive. Baseball was reborn. And Fenway, nobody was rhapsodizing about Fenway Park in those days. Tom Yawkey, I have it still, I saved it. He wrote a thing, he was quoted in the Sporting News in June of 67, I have to get out of this place. You can't make any money in this ballpark. I'm this is Tom Yawkey. And, and, and it, it's gotta go, it's, it's, it's had its day. And here we are 45 years later, you know, and look at Fenway now. So, um, but that's where he felt. It wasn't the great baseball basilica of Clark Boots' wonderful description or cathedral. It was like the old used sofa at grandma's house put out on the curb. You know, you want to put it out on the curb, somebody take it for free. That's the way they looked at Fenway in 1967 at the start of that season. So everything changed with 67. And it was a magical season with a great pennant race. And yeah, they didn't win. They went to the seventh game and we can rationalize as we all do and I do. 
Lomborg had two days rest, Gibson had three. That's just the luck of the draw. You know, Gibson still had something left and Lonnie didn't. Lomborg threw a one hitter and a three hitter in his first two starts. Nobody in the history of baseball has ever done that in the, play, in the world. So that, there were so many memorable things about, about 1967. And so it's not, my generation appreciates it, but we, we, I, I just hope we can pass this understanding on why it's the most important season in Red Sox history. You wouldn't have any of this business that goes on today, none of it, if it hadn't been for 67, they changed everything. Player, as time goes on, um, and I, I never resisted this, but I, uh, and my great friend, Peter Gammons, I asked him this question, who's my, and, and he's, Dwight Evans has, is probably not getting his total historical due. I'm not saying has to be in the Hall of Fame, but it would hardly be a disgrace if he were in the Hall of Fame. And, and he's there as good as other people were in there. And, and uh, he played right field beautifully. And, and, and one of the rare players, it's just, it's just an oddity. There are very few players. You don't need your whole hand to count them, who had a better second half of their career than first statistically, that he was better in his 30s than in his 20s. And, 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 and that, that's a rare player. Uh, but he was a, 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 a wonderful player. And uh, I would have to say off the top of my head, that would be the answer to the most underrated, even though he's, you know, but not getting his full due. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today, but I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us. Can I have one closing statement? Yeah. About the book, okay? The couple of things, the, thing, the big thing that Bill, Chuck, and I want to stress about this book, it's about the beauty of baseball. This is my 1400 game collection of games. If you or, or anybody out there watching and listening had his or her separate 1400 games over that same period of time, you would have stuff in there of interest that would be, that would be in your book that is comparable to the stuff that's in my book. Baseball is the richest game. And I close with this. And I'm noted for basketball and I love basketball. It's been great and it's been great for my career and I love playing it more than anything that I could play. There is more conversational fodder available in baseball than football, basketball, and hockey put together. And if you want to throw in soccer, I'll, I'll make it four. It, it's the richest game. It's the most diverse game. It's the most fascinating game. It's the most historical game. And we hope we capture some of that in our book. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good evening.